introduce our keynote speaker, Matt Borg. Uh, Matt is a librarian, trainer, consultant, writer and self-confessed troublemaker. Sounds a bit like me, actually. <laughs> He's interested in helping libraries implement systems that help students thrive in an information-rich environment. To do this, Matt says he crafts stories around products and makes connections between disparate concepts to help librarians understand the importance of user-focused tools. Matt has 15 years' experience as an academic librarian, which he says helps him to understand the needs and workflows of library users and the challenges and constraints facing libraries today. He has taught on two undergraduate modules at Sheffield Business School, looking at business analysis and financial and management information. His technical skills include website design, HTML, CSS, combining visuals and excellent communication. Matt has worked for ProQuest as an eSolutions expert since July 2014. And his keynote speak is speaking is not all about ex libris products, but would like to concentrate on the user experience point of view and um, I, th I think this would be a really great topic for discussion afterwards so hopefully you can participate and um, question Matt um, and his analysis so please welcome Matt. Hi good morning um, apologies for the cut and paste from LinkedIn that was um, slightly embarrassing to hear it read out back to you you forget that when you write those things, people are going to say it back. I wanted to write at the level on the last sentence. He's writing this himself in the third person, but um, <laughs> Amanda Healy suggested it wasn't the, um, the, the best thing to do. <clears throat> so, so thank you, Jeanette. Thank you for that introduction. Um, my name's Matt, Matt Borg. Um, we're going to be talking to you today about um, user experience in libraries. Um, to fill you in, I'm, uh, as you may, I'm from England. Uh, I arrived yesterday evening. Um, I'm, my, I was in Chicago for two weeks just last week, so my body clock is messed up. And I heard from my partner, Rachel, that my eldest broke his arm in two places yesterday. So it's all a bit of a... First of all, she's like, have a great time, by the way. Um, he's fine, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> but I think I need to buy some Lego on the way home for Dylan and lots of flowers, right, for Rachel, I think? Okay. <clears throat> okay, um, so before we start, we've told you today's session is going to be a little bit about user experience, um, user experience in libraries. So I just wondered if we could have a quick show of hands in the room. Who is directly involved in our libraries and our institutions in user experience? Put your hands up. Okay, so uh, the record show about half, maybe slightly more of the 70, 80 people in the room put their hands up. That's useful, that's very good. Thank you very much. Um, um, okay, so Matt's perspective. Um, my surname is Borg, so therefore I, I name all of my titles after Star Trek and the Next Generation episodes. So uh, a matter of perspective... It's true. <laughs> a matter of perspective. Season 3, episode 12. Come on. <clears throat> I think. I actually made that up. I should know that. I should look it up. Um... So a quick question, um, what do you think of when I tell you the date September 3rd, 1967? <laughs> September the 3rd, 1967. I, I must remember the right hand side of the room because I keep looking at you guys. So September the 3rd, right hand side of the room, 1967. A car. The clue is in the picture. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I normally give out um, sweets and stuff, but I, I started throwing sweets at UKSG once, in, um, which is a conference in the UK, and I almost hit a librarian, so they said, no more throwing of chocolate, please. But afterwards, we'll get chocolate, okay? Um, cars. Cars is close enough. September the 3rd, 1967, is a very important day in Sweden. It's um, uh, the day that they decided to move traffic from driving on the left-hand side of the road to driving on the right-hand side of the road. But eight million people lived in Sweden at the time. Um, and uh, there's a gentleman called Roman Mars, and he does a podcast, uh, and he talks in great detail about the change that Sweden went through to move their inhabitants from driving from one side of the road to the other. Um, at the time, 
As you can imagine, this was the biggest change to um, traffic infrastructure that Sweden had ever come across, and certainly probably uh, worldwide in the, in the late 60s. It's the biggest kind of uh, traffic infrastructure program that went on. Why we drive on the left or the right is actually quite hard to pin down when you start researching this kind of thing, which I do because, as I should have said in my introduction, I'm also a geek. So you look up these kind of things. And the generally accept accepted rationale behind it is that motorized vehicles were developed and introduced in various countries, uh, and they generally tended to follow the side of the road that horses and carriages would drive along. Um, there are various stories about riding horses on the left being uh, more useful because then you've got your right hand free for sword fighting. There's actually quite... Yeah, this is true. Um, I thought to myself, should I do the sword fighting? I should do the sword fighting. <clears throat> but there's actually very little evidence for the sword fighting uh, story. Um, and as you know from the uh, display on the screen behind us, about 65% of the world drive on the right as opposed to um, us more cultured countries which drive on the, um, on the correct side of the road. <laughs> um, so up until 1967, Sweden drove on the left-hand side of the road. And it was different from its neighbouring countries. And Sweden doesn't benefit from the fact that you know, Australia and, and, and the UK are islands. So if you have um, uh, neighbouring countries driving on the different side of the road to you, that's problematic. Yeah? Particularly when people from Norway and Denmark would visit um, Sweden, they'd have to you know, negotiate all of a sudden moving over. Now, it is possible to convert left-handed traffic to drive on the right-hand side of the road. You simply, um, now this is the H day, this is the slide I missed, um, the H day stuff, which comes from the Swedish word called Hoga Traffic Lomningen, which is uh, Swedish for right-hand drive day. They called it H day. It is possible to convert left-hand traffic to right-hand traffic. So uh, if you needed to do that, you could build a wonderful clover leaf construction like this. This is the um, uh, wonderful and complex Lotus Bridge uh, connecting Macau, where they drive on the left, to mainland China, where they drive on the right. Okay? So you can see you come across and you kind of go around one of the clover leaves and you end up on the other side of the road. Or if you're driving from England onto the continent into France, it's fine. You, you enter the train, the Channel Tunnel, on the left-hand side at St. Pancras in London, um, and you come out on the French side, and they've built this wonderful... Uh, kind of complex roundabout where you go onto the roundabout and then you swivel around the roundabout and you come out of the roundabout on the correct hand side of the road. Which is lovely and kind of the French to build this huge traffic infrastructure to accommodate people from the UK. I wonder what we do when French people come and visit us. <laughs> so Sweden were faced with a problem. It's hard to drive a left-handed uh, left drive vehicle on a left-hand drive road. That's quite a hard sentence to say, let alone think about. Driving a left-hand side vehicle on the left-hand side of the road. The steering wheel is in the wrong place. Overtaking is particularly hard, for example, because you can't see the oncoming cars particularly clearly. So in the early 50s, the Swedish government decided to do something about it. Um, they also produced and manufactured lots of cars internally to Sweden. They had to then you know, have two manufacturing lines, one for internal and one for exporting. So the Swedish government decided to do something about it. And, as governments do, they decided to put it to the popular vote, and they had a referendum on it. Um, and the Swedish public decided, and they um, voted 88%, uh, sorry, 82% voted no in the first. We want to stick with it. We don't mind that it's complicated. We don't mind that we have to stop at the border and move on to their own side. We want to stick with what we're doing. The government went ahead and did it anyway, as governments tend to do. Um, <clears throat> And they decided that in order to kind of ease, you like, if you like, the um, uh, Swedish population into this new change, they needed um, a particular approach. So they did three specific things. They looked at education. They looked at mass media and communication and how they could get the message out there. And they thought internally, they had a big think tank set up about what problems might be encountered. One of the ways they dealt with one education uh, was to think about what kind of information and material might be needed um, for the population, for the switch. Like what might be different? How would it affect drivers and what to look out for? 
which is an interesting challenge if you sit back and think about it. How do you do that if, like me, you've ever been in a um, car driving on the opposite side of the road to what you're normally used to? It's really hard to start with, right? You, you kind of start off and all of a sudden you, you, you're concentrating and you're really thinking about, you know, I'm trying to do not quite the exact opposite, but some things are opposite and some things aren't. So you have to educate people, if you're doing this for a whole population, on the things to do now, which might feel wrong, but are actually right, and the things to keep doing, which are still right, even though they might feel wrong. So it's a really kind of tricky, complex um, uh, uh, educational um, task to undertake. Um, so the team behind education designed a pamphlet that showed where you needed to be at all times, including where you needed to be as a pedestrian if you were walking across the road, and which way you'd look out for. Okay? I'm very privileged in my job. I get to travel all over um, Europe and the world, uh, meeting librarians and talking to people. I still have to think twice about which side of the, what country I'm in before I cross the road. Even today, which is normal for me, walking down here, I was still thinking, and cyclists in, in Seattle, forget about it. You know, it doesn't matter which way you look, they're coming at you. Um, so the education department tried to think about ways they could, they could um, teach everybody how this would be happening. Um, the mass media approach was very different as well. They wanted to be cultural. They wanted to be entertaining about this. Um, so one of the things they did was produce a single. They actually held a competition. Competition for the best song to publicise H Day. And the Telstars won with, um, uh, I can't say it in Swedish, but it basically translates as keep to the right, Svensson. You can see it um, on the left-hand side. Del T. Holger Svensson. Keep to the right, Svensson. You can, and I would be a terrible speaker if I didn't recommend this, find that on YouTube and watch it during the break. <laughs> um, okay. So September arrives, H day arrives, and all non-essential traffic is banned from the roads. The only people around are the construction crews taking covers off uh, the new signs, um, some uh, tram drivers are, 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 are engaged, some taxi drivers who are allowed permission to be on the road are allowed to be out, and a few journalists. Um, and then at 5 a.m., it all changes, and everyone's allowed on the roads. 5 a.m., it all changes, everyone's allowed back on the roads. And here's the thing, a lot of people thought it might be a catastrophe, lots of people expecting huge, huge, huge problems, but actually the H-Day transition team had, had accounted for nearly everything. The total number of traffic-related deaths on H-Day was zero, and the total number of accidents was very, very, very low in the single digits. Um, you know, much, much lower than you would expect on a normal day. And it's quite simple when you think about the reasons for this, because it's, as, you, as I just explained, if you start driving on a different side of the road you're used to, you're taking more care, you're taking more attention, you know this big change has happened. So in that respect, the efforts of the, um, of the government in educating the, the population were very, very successful. But they missed something. In, the under, in, the, in trying to understand what problems might be encountered, they were very theoretical about it, and they did that planning with the scale models, they're very theoretical about it. But the biggest problem was that people got lost. People who were used to driving a particular route just couldn't find their way to home or to work again. Um, they just weren't used to driving on the other side of the road. It changed their perception about how they were driving. One-way streets, for example, were still one way, but one way in the other direction, which could throw somebody out who'd been doing that route for a very long time. Nobody had actually looked at it from the perspective of the navigator, of the driver, just doing their normal commute. You can legislate for this, and you can try and do that think tank, and you can try and understand how people might use something, but until actually people are doing it, it's very, very hard. The H Day team didn't really understand the journey that their users were on in that case. So, user experience in libraries. UX in libraries. Today's library services are super complex, right? Long, long gone are the days when we were only concerned with how to arrange stock, although we never really were concerned with that. You know what, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm not being flippant, I'm just trying to think about the kind of things we were doing um, a long time ago. Um, 
we were concerned with stop, we were concerned with uh, access, but you know, almost restricting access. You know, the days when we had the CD-ROMs, but they were locked up? You know, who's got the key for the CD-ROM today? That kind of thing. So UX in libraries tries to look at these complex library services in lots and lots of different ways. One of those ways is thinking about what problems people might encounter and trying to understand that and trying to um, uh, deal with that as those problems might come up. But fundamentally, it's more about the user, the student, the staff member, the academic member, the customer, the user, and their interaction with our libraries. It's about how people interact with our library resources. And by resources, I mean everything, okay? Um, people, uh, databases, um, the, the, the holds shelf, the, the self-issue machines, the gates that you come through and you swipe your card in, all of these things. All of the ways, just think about all the ways that our members, our users, interact with our libraries in these day and age. Using the CERC desk, using a mobile app, picking a book off the shelf, discovery systems, using the library website and databases, all these kind of things that our users have to engage with. Any interaction that they're engaged with is the business of user experience in libraries. And all of these potential interactions are called touch points. And it's these touch points and how we design these touch points that we need to think about. In some ways, when you think about UX in libraries, it's useful to think about what it isn't. And it's certainly not, for example, just good customer service. Although I think we would all agree that the service we provide our users is crucial uh, and super important. But it's much more than good customer service. It's much more than that kind of quantitative data that we've been collecting for a very, very long time. And it's much more than usable websites, although we'll come on to uh, usability, which is one of my um, uh, things I like talking about. Um, usable websites is something that kind of is kind of my pathway, my gateway drug, if you like, into user experience in libraries. Um, a few years ago, I was engaged in a project at Sheffield Hallam, and it was to redesign the library website, um, or get rid of the link farm, as I called it at the time. And we'd recently brought Summon, so, which was a, the, the ProQuest discovery system at the time, and we were thinking of a way to integrate um, Summon into the, the, the library website. And I had a conversation online with somebody, and I said, do you know what, I just want to make this thing usable. And a colleague from um, uh, Touchpoints, usable, and a colleague from Michigan um, called Matthew Reedsman, um, he pulled me up on that, and he said, no, we shouldn't just be trying to make things usable. We should be aiming higher. Usable is just like making food edible. Okay? That's just kind of what you, what, the very, very minimum you need to do. It's just like the beans on toast that you would have in the evening. Okay? That's usable. What you really want to aspire to is to, um, uh, is to delight people. You know, it's kind of, we had a bit of a to and throw, and I wasn't particularly convinced, but the more we talked about it, the more I could see that, yeah, usable is the bare minimum that we should be aiming for. Um, instead, what we were thinking about was, um, I mean, what talk is good without some sort of um, hierarchy of needs? Um, we could get rid of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs with um, actually <coughs> putting this pleasurable thing at the top, okay? So making sure that the stuff we're using, the interfaces that we're dealing with, the, the touch points that our users have to engage with are functional, reliable, and usable, but the pleasurable bit is missing. That emotional connection at the top is generally missing from the things we were doing. And this is what my conversation with Matthew was about. You know, how do you ele elevate, rather, the library website to this thing that's enjoyable? And actually, there's some, this is all sounding a bit um, uh, uh, airy-fairy, but there's some, there's some science behind this, because actually, when people start interacting and engaging on an emotional level, that affects the part of our brain that helps with learning. So actually, the things that Google do with their special little doodles, when you can go onto Google and it's a special day, you know, those things are great and they keep you checking and they keep you sharing Google. But actually, that kind of um, interaction actually makes us think and remember how we're doing stuff as we're going through it. So it's quite an interesting um, uh, um, exercise to undertake. And actually, a guy called Aaron Schmidt talks about it a lot in his book, which is called Useful, Usable, and Desirable, which is quite a useful and uh, unusable and quite a desirable book. I didn't mean that. Um, 
And actually, it helped me when I was working at Hallam, and now that I do some work with libraries uh, on user experience, it helps me to explain it in this way. Useful is just satisfying that need. Usable is it's essential, but it's only part of that overall package, and desirable is connecting with our users. And for me, that was the nice part of um, uh, making the library website. One of the ways this comes across is our, in how we can measure engagement. So, you know, we, we can talk about this and we can talk about pretty book covers and all that kind of thing. But actually, when we start using these uh, in our work, in our tools, in our resources, we can start seeing interactions. So, this, for example, is a text message, a link, at the top of the screen I put onto the new library website. Because I wanted people to have a look at our new reading list software. And we called it resource list. We had a link at the top, and it said, have a look at resource lists online. And it took them through to the new reading list software. And because we were very concerned about qualitative measures, sorry, quantitative measures, we could then track and see how many people had linked through. And in a week, we got maybe, I don't know, seven or eight hits on that text link, OK, in one week. And it was right at the top. And it wasn't you know, vacation time. It was right at the top of the page. So I did this. Um, these are the books you're looking for as a picture in the middle of the page. And uh, in a week, we had over 100 hits on that page, which took them through to resource. Now, again, it's, we don't know how many of those 100 people actually looked at resource lists online, but we've increased significantly the engagement with our users. That's functional, but that's you know, desirable or emotional. You can engage there. Uh, this is the um, uh, picture we had up. <laughs> when we had a survey monkey going for, to test, you know, what did you think of the new discovery system? Is it in love with library search or are you seeing Google on the site? Okay, and you can do it in different ways. So this is just a simple book drop. Books you loved, books you didn't, everything else, okay? Instead of having one, two, and three, you know. You can do these things and you can engage with our users. And it's important because, as Matthew would say, so Matthew, I should have said, he's the uh, web services librarian at Grand Valley State University. And he did a keynote at our first user experience conference. Uh, and Matthew would say that this is all important because our libraries are people. Our library is people. Okay? And sometimes I think I'm as guilty as anybody else of forgetting this. We talk about discovery systems. We talk about um, library service platforms. We talk about Alma, Leganto, Primo, and Summon. And sometimes we forget about the connections that we need to be making between those products those products and the people that work in our lives. And by people, I include everybody that might be in the library, including our staff behind the counters. OK, so Don Norman is a very intelligent gentleman. So when he says stuff and I read his stuff, I tend to um, uh, pay attention. And Don suggests that knowing how people use something is essential. OK? So this is taking us now beyond that kind of aspirational design approach, thinking about actually understanding how people use stuff. And Don would say, knowing how, to, how people use something is essential. And for years as librarians, I feel like we've allowed our kind of expert intuition to influence in some way, to some degree, the way we present information and resources to our users. One of the beautiful traits of the library profession is that kind of inherent need and want to help the user, to help our people. It's built into Ranganathan's laws, right? Right through to the reference interview that you might carry out with somebody at the desk. The desire to help is embedded, I think, in our culture and our profession. And it's certainly been a driving force for information professionals. Um, but I could possibly argue that sometimes it's been a curse as much as a blessing. I'm not sure, I don't want to speak for anyone in the room, but how many times have we been in a meeting where we said, right, we need to come up with the top 10 FAQs for this new database we've bought? And you spend an hour coming up with 10 things that probably aren't Fs and sometimes aren't As and sometimes aren't even Qs, right? <laughs> but we've gone with that desire to help and push out the information we think the user needs. But sometimes we have an expert blind spot. Intuitions are fast, but they can sometimes be wrong. And simply because they're not always taken from the user perspective. And as Schmidt would say, um, we are not our patrons. This is 
the guy that wrote that book. He, he also sells pencils. <laughs> <clears throat> we are not our users. And in order to understand the perspective of our users, we need to start uncovering the kind of stuff they're engaged with. And that's hard, because there's a lot of complexity and detail in what our users are doing. In engaging with those touch points that we listed, there's lots of complexity and detail there. And we can only do this by being in our users' shoes or by talking to our users or actually being there. Um, and this is where we look to ethnography and anthropology to help us and the kind of the history of those disciplines that we can start taking bits of and bringing them into our libraries. And there's essentially two types of kind of behavioural research we can engage in. Attitudinal research and behavioural research. So your attitudinal are things like your surveys and your questionnaires, your focus groups, those kind of things. But your behavioural are things like your contextual inquiry, journey mapping, usability, cultural probes, digital and physical um, space mapping looking at whether, you know, whether you're a visitor or a resident in the area. And there's whole kind of tool sets and frameworks we can use to help us in this. Okay? And we'll talk about those um, in a short while. But we can and we do use lots of the kind of um, quantitative techniques in our libraries. Most of us, I think by now, we can kind of um, follow the user as they do a search, not in a stalky, creepy way, sorry, I didn't mean that. But you can see what the user is doing from, a, from a, a search in the discovery system through to a full text link, or whether they're taking books out, that kind of thing. You know, how many books have been issued this term, that kind of thing. So we can see the search experience happening as a, as a statistic, but we have no idea whether it was a successful search experience. Did that full text, did the click on the full text link actually mean the PDF was useful? You know, was it even relevant to their studies? Is that what they were doing, or were they just trying to you know, copy and paste the first paragraph for their assignment? Similarly, a library gate stat. As you walk in, you register. As you swipe in, you register. A library gate stat doesn't tell us whether that trip to the library was a useful one. The resource they needed might have been out on loan. Or they may, even on a multi-site campus, been at the wrong campus. Right? They may have had an awkward or off-putting uh, experience with a member of staff. They may have had a fantastic and a wonderful experience with a member of staff. But we don't know because we're just looking at statistics. Um, and the main problem with surveys, or as I found out, um, they are also known as demand side primary research. Anyone come across this term before? Demand side primary research? No, you can put this into Google and it, um, uh, it uses Google Translate. And you can see it says marketing jargon. It's a questionnaire, really. But I like this demand side primary research, the questionnaires we do. Um, well, we know the problem with these kind of things because. Um, questionnaires are generally filled in by pro-library users, okay? The users that generally don't mind filling those kind of things in. Um, Self-reporting can be unreliable, you know, just ticking the first uh, circles on the line. Um, comments boxes are often left empty. Sometimes we do closed or leading questions. They're too long and our students, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but in, in the UK, we expose our users, our students, to many, many services many, many surveys. Um, and as a co uh, Brian e. Ramson's a, a colleague at Huddersfield University who's um, uh, presenting at this year's uh, user experience conference. And I was talking to her uh, quite some time ago now um, about user experience. And she just said, you know, um, one of the things I like to think about is, as a librarian, how much time do we actually spend in the library? And she qualifies. She's not talking about just being in the back office or being on the um, issues desk or just wandering around doing head counts. She actually means being in the library, using the space as a user might. Do you eat, drink, or exist in your library as anything other than a member of staff? I think this is a really interesting point. And when I was speaking to Bryony about this, I tried to reflect on my time at Sheffield Hallam and how much time I'd been in the, the library as a user. Um, 
and I don't think it was that much. Even though I was doing a, 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 a master's degree at the time, I would generally study from home. So actually being in the library and existing in the library is hard to do. <clears throat> so let's jump into um, ethnography really quickly. Ethnography is about watching people. And by adapting user experience research techniques, um, primarily in ethnography, and looking also at usability and some human-centered design, the way we design things, um, we can actually uncover that complexity and detail from the users who engage with our libraries. Users who will do things in ways that we find frustrating, or things that we don't even understand, or dare I say it, even condemn. So a chemistry student I worked with uh, about two years ago now, and I actually carried out a contextual inquiry with them, which we'll come on to in a bit, which is kind of like a, a structured interview. Um, and I was trying to seek information about how um, she was engaging with the uh, resources in the library. And it was a very simple, kind of half an hour um, uh, uh, process. And she was focusing very much on the time at looking at dissertations. Um, so she was going into the dissertation, the stack, the closed access, um, uh, you couldn't borrow them, but she, she was going in, and she was photographing every page of this dissertation on her uh, mobile phone. And I was like, okay, interesting. Um, I was thinking, that's interesting, you know, that's time consuming for me, and it's quite a lot of effort. Um, and I think it's a grey area copyright wise but you know part of the contextual inquiry is not to make judgments it's just to under, try and understand why they are doing a thing and as part of the contextual inquiry I spoke to her and it just turned out that the chemistry school, school of chemistry had some very comp I'm trying to say it carefully there were some crazy ways that they wanted their dissertations um, uh, set out unique and distinctive ways they wanted their dissertations set out and there were no examples on the School of Chemistry um, uh, VLE, the virtual learning environment. So the, the user was taking a picture of every single page and she had a super complex system where photos could, would be synced with her Dropbox so that she could then get onto a laptop and she could find all these photos and she could see the structure. She didn't care about the content. It was, even, you know, it was, it was the right school, but it was a different kind of um, uh, area that she was studying. She just wanted to do that. And if I was just sat there watching somebody take photos without doing this interview, I'd be like, we need to stop that person doing the thing they are doing. Anyway, sorry, I went on too long. But it was, for me, it was an interesting um, uh, experience. It was an interesting experience. Because ethnography a lot is about the perspective of the user. And until you start putting yourself in their shoes, until you start talking to them and with them, it's very hard to do that. And ethnography and anthropology all kind of stems from uh, the work of um, uh, Bronislav Malinowski, who in the um, Trobriarian Trober Islands was studying um, the, the local natives. He was actually exiled for a bit in, um, in, 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 in uh, the First World War, and he was, happened to be exiled to some <coughs> islands called the Trobriarian Islands. And while he was there, he decided to... Uh, watch um, the native and engage with the native. Um, and as he suggested at the time, the final goal was to grasp uh, the native's point of view, their relation to life, and to realise their vision of the world, rather than his view as an outsider. So a lot of the stuff that he did builds on the, uh, the, the work of ethnography today is built on, and anthropology is built on. So for example, field notes, that kind of thing, comes from the work of Malinowski. Um, his methods, his techniques, his uh, methodologies have been used by lots of people. You might recognize some of the names we're going to come up with now. So Nancy Fried Foster, for example, is an anthropologist at the University of Rochester. Very, very um, wonderful, wonderful person, very intelligent. Um, and her big kind of... Um, uh, investigative piece was to try and learn about the interplay of environments and physical facilities in the research and writing processes of students. Okay? So she knew that it was going on but she didn't really understand how it was happening. So Nancy spent a lot of time doing things like photo studies and we'll come on to some of the methodologies we're talking about in a moment. Did things like photo studies, dorm visits would actually go to the dormitory and sit there and watch the student do their work. 
behavioral mapping, that kind of thing. She specifically saw an opportunity to learn more about where the student likes to study and why, with whom and when. And those kind of things then fed into the way they taught. This wasn't just the library focus, it's educationally focused. Another quite well-known name, Andrew Asher. Um, he carried out the um, ethno ethnographic research in Illinois Academic Libraries, which has got a great um, uh, acronym, ERIAL. Um, and Andrew was looking um, uh, on, a, on a very big two-year-long project here um, to look at things that we want to know the answers to in our profession, but often haven't been able to particularly be able to pin down particularly well. Like, why don't students come to the library for help anymore? <laughs> why do they just go and um, use... Uh, um, the information seeking tools they've got to them and why do they think that those things like Google don't just you know find stuff for them but also satiate your academic needs you know there's a disconnect there so Andrew's study was looking at things like that um, and actually Andrew's work has been pretty influential about how we now use ethnography in libraries another name is Donna Lonklow Donna um, is at UNC Charlotte she's a library ethnographer at UNC Charlotte um, and she looks at lots of different types of uh, ethnographic research projects, such as collaborative wayfinding. Okay? So instead of building a new building and then doing the signs or the library might just talk to facilities, um, actually they get the students to come up with the signage. And then they work with facilities and the libraries and the students as a, as a partnership. Um, also does things like cognitive mapping. Donna and I do uh, some things with um, visitor and residents. So we look at where people might sit on a scale of where they might be digitally. So are you on Twitter? And are you resident on Twitter? Or are you just visiting Twitter? You're just like dipping in. So we find that quite useful because you know, all these methodologies can, can situate where the user is physically in our libraries, but sometimes we want to know where they are digitally, right? We want to know what resources they're engaging with. Um, she also did a wonderful sleeping study, which we'll come across in a minute, where Basically, the work of this piece was to just look at where people are sleeping in the library and map that. Uh, Andy Priestner. Um, Andy and I came up with the UX Libs conference. Um, and together we wrote uh, for and edited chapters in the UX Libs book, which I think we mentioned in the um, uh, start. But that's all we want to talk about with the book. Oh, sorry. No, I didn't mean that at all. <laughs> Drat. Sorry. Didn't mean that. Okay, fine. So... The User Experience Conference um, is about to, we're about to have its third iteration in Glasgow in two weeks' time, three weeks' time. Um, and I really like it. I really like doing it. I like being on the committee for it. Um, we set up the conference back in 2014, and the very first one, uh, we did it in Cambridge, and we had actually people doing some of these techniques, these ethnographic techniques, um, with some, some students, with some users at the time. Um, last year's in Manchester, we looked at kind of what work was going on in the field of ethnography. And this year, um, we're doing it up in Glasgow, in Scotland, and we've got uh, about 190 people coming, and we're going to set them off and do some actual ethnographic tasks again. We're going to get them doing some ethnographic research based on a university up there. So I'm really super looking forward to uh, UX Libs 3. Um, but in the last... 10 minutes or so, what I wanted to do was just skip through some techniques. So we've, we've mentioned some of these by name. I actually want to throw them up on the screen and just talk to you about how I've used them in my work or how other people have used them. And I think you, some of these names will be familiar to you from the, from the stuff I've just said, but also the work that's going on and the things that people generally are talking about in the world of UX Libs at the moment. Um, and we'll try and focus, sometimes we, we might make uh, reference to some of the exlibris uh, things we're doing as well. Uh, mapping techniques is a, is a nice one. Mapping techniques for me is a really nice kind of introductory way to start um, looking at how our users are actually engaging with our spaces. Um, so this is the sleep study thing that uh, we showed earlier. The highlighted spaces are where people were, were, would sleep. And you can kind of see that most of them are away from the issue desk. They just wanted to hide and sleep. And it's worth throwing this up, actually, because um, as I was speaking to Donna about the results of this, 
I said, um, you know, did you do anything? And she said, no, we didn't. Because actually they'd gone to um, uh, one of the um, groups that were looking at the work that was being engaged with. And I think somebody said, okay, well, what we need to do then is build a sleeping room. She was like, no, we don't, we don't need to build a sleeping room. Sometimes it's okay to know this kind of thing and not have to act on it. Just, it's just, you know, sometimes it's comforting to know that this thing goes on and it's okay sometimes for our students to sleep in the library. We might want to make sure that there's lots of access to, to fresh drinking water and that maybe we could get the cafe to open a little bit later. There are some things we can do, but sleeping rooms, sleeping bags, pillows might not be the, you know... <laughs> Um, mapping is useful because we don't always know how people are going to use a design space, okay? The way that human beings interact with design can often be quite far removed from the intent of the designer. So for a long time I've been talking about these things which are called desire paths. Everyone heard of these? Yep, some nods, okay? So you can see on the right-hand side of the screen that's the designed path, okay? All the way around there. But actually, it's much quicker and shorter to go down here. So that's the desired path. Um, so your sleeping example is a nice way of just looking at where people go. But you can also do mapping, as I said, of digital spaces as well as, as, well as physical. So here's an example of somebody mapping the types of digital spaces they inhabit. It's a technique I've used with quite a few libraries um, now. Um, having an understanding of the digital space, I think, is more and more important as, as time goes on. As the way that we, 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 uh, we use to interact with our resources and the way we push our resources out becomes more digital, then I think the way that people inhabit digital space becomes more and more important. So this is a lovely methodology where we, we use a continuum. You know, you don't have to be definitely here or definitely there. You can be somewhere along the, uh, uh, one of the axes, and it can either be for personal use or institutional use, or sometimes we might call that uh, educational use if we were talking with students. And sometimes they use Facebook as much for education as they do for catching up with their friends. Cognitive mapping is sometimes also referred to as this kind of mental model. And this is really, really helpful to uncover preferences about user priorities, about their routines. So this is lovely to do with staff, for example. I've done this with library staff. I've said, map out your day. And some people will do it as a building like this, and they will say where they go in the building. Others will do it as a flow chart as they go through their day. And you get them to use different colours as well. So you use one colour for two minutes and another colour for the next two. And that will help you determine priorities as well. So I quite like cognitive mapping for that kind of thing. This was used at the University of Cambridge to uncover uh, faculty learning landscapes, to kind of uncover information about learning and study habits of um, users, because you know the Cambridge setup where you have one main university library, but each of the colleges has their own separate library. So you have lots and lots of spaces in which the user might be. We've also used this kind of cognitive mapping with senior leaders uh, in libraries, senior leadership teams, to understand how to deliver strategic goals. So it's quite a useful model for that kind of thing as well. Personas is interesting as well. So you might have come across personas before. And this is a way that you, instead of trying to build for everybody, you think about who specifically might we be building for. So here's some examples from Grand Valley who come up with a couple of graduate students. So this particular graduate student is 24 years old. These are her needs and how they're served. This one is younger in a different subject area. So if you come up, if you come up with lots of different personas, you can start making sure that the things you're building can cover a wide range of people. And this is one of the techniques we use very much in terms of um, ProQuest and Ex Libris when we're looking at how we design interfaces. And we'll talk a wee bit about the kind of UI, the user interface frameworks. But we have this big, big, long stack of personas that we're constantly tweaking and, and, and playing around with. When we look at things like Alma, for example, we have um, acquisitions uh, workflow personas. So we kind of look at how different people might interact with our products. Interviews, we've kind of touched on very, very briefly. Um, already, and these cover a wide range of areas. Usability testing. I've got a slight soft spot for usability testing. 
I, it was like, as I said, it was my gateway drug into um, user experience. Um, I initiated this monthly usability program at Sheffield Hallam. Um, and the trick with these is just keep it simple. Just give your user three or four kind of real world tasks, you know, find a book, find a video, and see how they use your library website, how they use your discovery system. Um, give them like a, I don't know, a five pound cafe voucher. Um, some other people give away t-shirts, that kind of thing. Um, watch how they do it, and then make very small tweaks, and then go back the next month and ask some different questions, but that one thing you've tried to fix, ask the same question again. We had a great example where we asked somebody to find a video on the Olympics, and they went to our discovery system, and they ignored our discovery system, which was you know, massively in the middle of our website, and went down to the libguide we had on help using videos, which nowhere in that libguide could you find a video, but it had a search box to search the other libguides, they ended up looking for the Olympics, they ended up in the sports, anyway, it was a mess. <laughs> but you know, then we, 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 we renamed the placeholder text. It's from find books and articles to find books, articles, and videos. That was the only thing we did. The next month we tried it again, and everybody of the four we did, they went straight to that thing, okay? So you're not talking about massive amounts of students every month, just keeping it small, you're keeping it um, helpful. And actually, we find this so useful, we have in the Knowledge Center, um, some guidelines on how you can do this with our discovery products and some test scripts. So you can jump in and you can kind of have a look and see what we've got online. This is in the Knowledge Center. Touchstone tours are great good fun as well. You just basically follow somebody around with their permission and you record them and you say, take me to where you would normally go. Why do you like this space? What do you like about this bit over here? Um, I've used these on a number of occasions. It's great for kind of um, pulling out um, some of that more kind of tacit knowledge that's very hard to codify. You know, well, we really like it over here because if you're over there, you're seen by those people and the air conditioner is quite noisy. Oh, well, if you tell us the air conditioner is noisy, we can probably fix that. Oh, I didn't want to bother you. <laughs> you know, those kind of things that you can pull out from those. Contextual interview is much longer, kind of a guided thing uh, that you would do with some... Um, uh, with a user. And this was kind of like the um, uh, dissertation thing I was talking about earlier. Um, you, this is called a, like a master and an apprentice approach. So you're just kind of following them as they're going through it and learning from them. Um, a couple of others. Graffiti walls. These are becoming very, very, very popular. Essentially, one big sheet of paper and you say, write what you want. And people write what they want. And the scary thing is that people are going to be rude and they're going to be awful and they're going to be horrible. And the truth is people are rarely rude and they're rarely awful and they're rarely horrible. They might just say things like, um, uh, it's hot in here, and you can have a discussion. Um, card sorting is great for prioritizing. If you're doing a rebuild of a library website, you can do some cards and you can say, hey, do you know what, just prioritize these for me. And you could do different groups. It's a very nice way to quickly and roughly and readily kind of sort um, activities. Um, love and breakup letters are quite time intensive, but I would say they're just the most fun to engage with. Oops. Scary to do, because you actually what you're saying here is you ask your user to um, uh, write a, either a love letter or a breakup letter to one of the library services or the library resources. And actually we did this with some librarians once, and this is what somebody wrote to their toaster. Dear toaster, I love you toaster, you, are, you were hideously expensive, but you were worth it. And they go through. And it's just a nice way of, you know, you're anthropomorphizing, almost, um, uh, resources or objects, but you're getting really interesting um, developments out of that. You're getting some real kind of passion that you wouldn't often get just for those questionnaires and those surveys. I will say, is there anyone from, else from XP? No, I don't think so. And we're not recording this, so that's good. Um, I, did, uh, I did a session with some librarians in Denmark. At the, Royal, at the Royal Library. And in that session, I had a love letter to Alma. I always had a breakup letter to Alma in that <laughs> session as well. It's great for kind of exposing those kind of things. Okay. Frameworks, I, you know, I threw this in because I'm trying to think about the way that we also do this with Ex Libris products. So, uh, frameworks are a great way of kind of continuing um, a look or a theme across a range of um, uh, interactions that your user might have. So, for example, we have an overarching ProQuest UX framework, okay, which you can see online, and we put it out there, and we just say, this is how we build our stuff. 
I think we might say it a little bit more um, sophisticated than that, but this is how we build our stuff. Uh, and you can see it in some of the products we have. So, for example, the dissertation um, stuff. You can see that we've got a bit of a comparison from the framework to the product to Alma. So this is the new Alma UI. So you can kind of see how the merger of ProQuest and Exlibris has meant that we've got, as Exlibris, a great deal, and we had a lot of expertise, don't get me wrong, we had a great lot of work already done in establishing this, um, uh, this framework. And what I like about talking about Alma and the new UI is that it's so fundamentally about the way we present stuff for library staff. And lots of the things about UX in libraries talks about the user, which of course is super, super important, but I like the work we're doing with Alma to make it um, uh, uh, the, the tool that you want to engage with. Uh, and, the pre the, and having a framework like this means you can then take the framework and put it on GitHub, so the new Primo UI is on GitHub for you to take and mess around with and play around with and um, customize for your own users. So that's the power of things like that. But I thought it was useful to end on, you know, I keep going, you've got to be good, you've got to be careful, you've got to do this, you've got to, and I don't mean it. Uh, I'm just saying that these are some tools, these are some things, a mini little toolkit, if you like, that can help us in all of our work. Um, why is it important? Because we don't want to keep um, experiencing, getting our users um, interacting with bad user experience. So I found some examples of bad UX, and we'll see whether you think they're as bad as I do. So sometimes our user interface, this is a lift. So you can see you've got number one down here, number two over here, five, six, seven, eight, four, there's no number three. If you're on floor three, you're out of luck for that. Um, okay, this is a great example of user interface. I did a, a quite a different version of this talk in uh, Trondheim at uh, Igloo last year. On the way to Norway, my luggage was. So I had to go online and try and get my luggage. And it was a horrible experience. <laughs> it, I mean, they got it. A couple, three days later, it arrived. It was great. But it was awful. And not only that, it was you're trying to do it on your mobile phone, right? Because that's the, the, the access to the internet you've got. And none of this was responsive. So not just badly designed user interfaces, um, but also um, the point of need. When is your user likely to engage with this interface? Things like your email address one, your email address two. Does that mean the same email address twice? Or is it like an email address and then a backup email address? You shouldn't have to make your user make those decisions. Error messages. We're sorry. OK. OK. I like that one. I do like that one. Um, or confusing instructions. Cancel download. Would you like to cancel this download? Cancel. No. I mean, okay. No. <laughs> Let's not make our user think about these kind of things. And this, you know, and I'm saying, I'm pulling these off, and these are clearly not all from libraries, but I'm pulling these out as examples of how, of the things we might want to watch out for when we're going around. Wayfinding. Um, here's some, I'll zoom in. Here's some wayfinding where they've tried to use iconography. So you can see that the, the Apple Music app is on the left. The pre presents are on the right. Oh, that might be gift shop. That might be gift shop. Um, but I don't know where the key is. Is over here. <laughs> we might want to try and use iconography, and instead of using lots and lots and lots of text, but let's try and make it meaningful to the user. I don't know what the like. Px. I know. It doesn't matter. Over signage. This is my other great example. Remember the design lines from earlier? How do we fix that? <laughs> I love that. I've, uh, it's really good. Pencils. I like, I've used this one before. Too cool to do drugs. That's great. It's a great message. We should do this. This is a real life story, okay? We should do this. We should give pencils out to fifth graders in New York. This is where it happened. And then you sharpen the pencils. It's cool to do drugs. <laughs> Do drugs. <laughs> drugs. I like that example. Um, and doors. So I can do some things okay. 
Some things I do pretty well, some things are okay. Um, we've established I'm a geek, um, I'm quite technically minded, I can drive, I've driven on both sides of the road. I have two human children that um, are not dead, one of them's damaged, but it wasn't my fault, I was in Australia. Um, so why is it that as a human being approaching my 40th birthday, I, f I still find doors confusing? I've long had a little rant in my head about doors. Doors I get to when I push them, but they're pull. Or doors I get to that need to be pushed, uh, but, you know, the other way around. Or doors I think are automatic. <laughs> and I stand there, waiting patiently, and then they're not, because there's a button you press, or somebody just looks at you and opens the door, and you just follow them through. And as soon as you start um, looking for confusing doors, I can promise you you'll find them everywhere. Um, and they're actually called Norman doors after Don Norman, who we, who we met uh, briefly earlier. And it's a design, the problem with Norman doors is it's a design where the thing is telling you to do the exact opposite of what you are supposed to do. A door that gives the wrong signal and needs a sign to correct it, for example. A big door with a big handle that's a push door is a Norman door. Um, so this is like another problem that we, we can encounter in our things. So... It's very easy for me, and I'm very lucky, and I'm very privileged, as I've said. I get to travel all over the place, and I get to speak to lots of users, I get to do these kind of things. And I don't mean to say, you've done none of this, you need to start doing this. I'm not standing up here from a position of, you've been doing everything wrong. What I'm just trying to say is, there's some really cool and interesting stuff going out in the world, going on in the world of, of, of libraries, of, of ex libris. We're doing some cool and interesting stuff ourselves. And that's why I really feel lucky to be in the role I'm in, where I get to work with libraries and I get to look at how we're kind of building these products. Um, I'm here until afternoon break, then I have to go to Sydney. But it has been a huge delight, and I'm so uh, uh, thankful to be invited to come today. Um, find me in the break, ask me any questions. Um, but we're at time, so thank you very much indeed.